The following program is rated M for a mature audience. It contains coarse language and violence. This is BBC News, the headlines at midnight. Up to 400,000 secret American military files about the Iraq war are published. From PBS News World Headquarters. It is a leak that is more like a flood. Hundreds of thousands of secret U.S. military documents from the Iraq War released today by the website WikiLeaks. The first casualty of war is the truth. But the attack on the truth by war begins long before war starts and continues long after a war ends. Are they modern day heroes? Today's Robin Hood's helping their fellow man. Or are they irresponsible hackers out for fame and glory? We should condemn in the most uh, clear terms WikiLeaks has provided the public with thousands of state secrets. Is Julian Assange a criminal? Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. <laughs> this is me here, grabbing the boy and running with the boy. When the video came out and they realized that I was the soldier on the ground in that video, then everybody wanted to talk to me. Will the disclosures change the world? How far can one trust what's in the documents? It's funny, some small incidents get huge write-ups and some big ones, not at all. It's the base ingredient for any investigation, but it is the, the start, it isn't the conclusion. The White House blasting the release of over 90,000 U.S. military records on the war in So what is behind WikiLeaks? We've examined their strengths and weaknesses, the myth and the mystery. <laughs> Getting inside WikiLeaks isn't easy. Each of their workplaces is carefully hidden from prying eyes, temporary operating centers. In London, WikiLeaks has based itself inside the offices of a non-profit organization, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Julian Assange is known to occasionally spend time here. He seems to encourage the Matrix-like secrecy. WikiLeaks exists in a virtual space and obviously also in real spaces. We're a multinational organization, so we have technical infrastructure, financial infrastructure, and people um, all over the world. But we don't have you know, our locations listed publicly. And there's very good reasons for that. WikiLeaks has been around since 2006, and Julian Assange is not the website's only boss. Hackers appear to be the driving force. Daniel Domscheit-Berg of the Chaos Computer Club in Berlin, to name but one. In some way, I, I assume I can be called a hacker. A hacker is anyone who is interested in um, bringing change to a system, and that's certainly part of what I'm doing. Good afternoon. WikiLeaks also has its share of enemies. The biggest threat comes from the U.S. Army, from whom they WikiLeaks spirited away hundreds of thousands us. of documents. We want whatever they have returned to us, and we want whatever copies they have expunged, erased, gone. The very first warnings by the Pentagon were somewhat vague. We are asking them to do the right thing. We are asking them to return stolen property. If doing the right thing is not good enough for them, uh, then we will figure out what other alternatives we have to compel them to do the right thing. Um, let me leave it at that. Daphne. Do you own a mobile phone? 
I, I have many mobile phones, but when you're involved in this sort of business, um, there's security procedures you have to go through to prevent mobile phones being used to tracking you. And th those procedures are known to intelligence agencies, uh, or drug dealers, and so on. Uh, investigative journalists should look more about uh, what drug dealers and intelligence agencies do to protect themselves. Their story is a modern myth. Armed with just a few computers, a small group of young journalists and programmers has become a real nightmare for the world's only superpower. The WikiLeaks legend really begins during the Iraq War. Army base 65 kilometers from Baghdad, a young American GI is classifying military intelligence in a computer. Incident reports and video filmed by the combat troop. He's regularly in direct contact with evidence of war's daily brutality. Innocent civilians indiscriminately killed, the thousands of victims no one seems to care about. And hardly any of this ever makes the evening news. Until one day, this anonymous GI sees a video filmed from an Apache helicopter showing a military engagement unfold in the streets of Baghdad. The evidence before his eyes seems to indicate proof of a war crime. Clear. The soldier risks disobeying orders and makes a CD-ROM of the video. If he's caught, he knows he'll be court-martialed. So he comes up with an unusual alibi. The question is, how was he able to download all this information without drawing suspicion to himself? So, in fact, he told people, apparently, that when he was actually downloading some of this sensitive information onto a CD, he was actually listening to Lady Gaga. I mean, it wasn't true at all, but that's what he told people. And they said, oh, okay, that's fine. That, now we understand what he's, why he's spending so, t so much time, why it's taking so long for him to do whatever he's doing. The young soldier is crazy about IT. In the world of the internet, WikiLeaks is already famous. It's a site that dares publish what the mainstream media might censor. The word wiki means accessible to all and in all safety. We have an anonymous uh, safe harbor, so we accept these documents anonymously. Um, we have very strong mechanisms to protect the sources that we have. And Daniel Domscheit-Berg was one of those who helped build the unique WikiLeaks website. It was built in a way that whistleblowers remain anonymous to the project itself. So whenever something was received, it was not clear uh, where it came from. So the whistleblower should feel secure in a way that if he feels something should be out in the public, um, there is not an instance that is then judging about his feelings. It's difficult to tell what is actually happening in the video sent by the soldier. It needs deciphering. When I first saw it, actually it didn't have that much impact on me. Because I didn't know where it was, when it was, what was the circumstances, who were these people, etc. It was only by following the path through the thing and seeing how relaxed and sort of innocent most of the people were in the video that the carnage then became uh, so outrageous. To make sense of the video, the WikiLeaks people took it to Iceland, a remote island in Europe's North Atlantic. The island state was brought to the brink of bankruptcy by a massive corruption scandal. Iceland seemed a natural choice to find accomplices. One such was Kristin Hansen, a former investigative journalist with Iceland State Television. He helps the WikiLeaks team set up in an unassuming house, which quickly acquires a military nickname. The curtains were drawn and uh, people tried to keep a low profile. I don't think that the owners of the house knew anything what was going on there. People used to call it the bunker, you know, because people were bunkered in and stayed there for quite uh, a long time. Julian Assange is the team leader. 
The video sequence is 38 minutes long, and the military jargon used between the pilots and their base has to be deciphered. After a few days, they finally understand what the video actually shows. This is one of the most significant uh, visual material coming out of Iraq. Probably as important uh, and, uh, as the, uh, the photographs from uh, Abu Ghraib. The video was filmed in July 2007 from an Apache helicopter as it hovers over a district of Baghdad. In the streets below, the US infantry will soon make an appearance and the helicopter acts as an aerial surveillance, an escort. Suddenly, the chopper's camera focuses in on a group of Iraqis. Two of them are carrying weapons. The helicopter asks its base commanders for permission to open fire. One eight have five to six individuals with AK-47s. Request permission to engage. It's actually quite complex to understand. And so I could see that oh, it's incredible there's some kind of slaughter here. But once I started discovering more and more detail, this is when it became more emotional. So to understand that, yes, this person was a journalist from Reuters, and this was a, a driver uh, from Reuters. Among the victims, WikiLeaks identifies 40-year-old Saeed Shmag, an assistant and driver, and 22-year-old Namir Nur Eldin, a Reuters photographer. And the helicopter pilot uh, obviously sees Namir and Said as, uh, as uh, insurgent and uh, instantly decides that uh, the cameras are, are weapons. We got an RPG. Alright, we got a guy with an RPG. Come on a fire. An RPG is, uh, you know, probably what? Uh, five times longer than a cannon with a, a two or three hundred millimeter lens. Firing. But this is a death sentence basically for those guys. Light them all up. Come on, fire! Hey, Roger. Keep shooting. Keep shooting. Keep shooting. Kyle? Sorry. I hit him. I hit him. Oh, yeah, look at those dead bastards. We managed to track down a former American soldier who witnessed the shootings and agreed to be interviewed. In his opinion, the opening salvos were justified. Right here, there's a man standing there with an RPG. There was no RPG round, it was just the RPG. Another man over here has, has an AK-47. I can understand the viewpoint of the Apache pilot to fire on the group of men because the screen that they're looking on in that Apache is very small, very small black and white. So they're, they're making war judgments, judgments in the fog of war. The Apaches are approximately a mile and a half away from where these men are gathering on the ground. A few minutes later, the first tragic mistake in a series of events that allegedly become a war crime. A black van pulls up to help the injured. There are no insurgents inside the van, but a family with two children. The pilots invent a story about an imminent threat and ask for permission to start firing again. Come on. Clear. Bodies are strewn everywhere, and shortly afterwards, the first U.S. ground forces arrive. Ethan McCord is among the squad that is on the scene. So this is me here. I was one of about six who were dismounted at the time, um, running up onto the scene. Stunned by what he sees, McCord takes several photographs. It was shocking. It was, I had never seen anything like that before. I saw on the corner um, what appeared to have been uh, three men um, 
I, they were completely destroyed by the 30 millimeter rounds. Um, the rounds are in a 30 millimeter are like that big. They contain depleted uranium. It almost, to me, didn't seem real. It, it, it kind of seemed like something that you would see out of a bad horror movie. McCord doesn't realize the extent of the bloodshed until he approaches the van. Inside, the two children, a four-year-old girl and a 10-year-old boy, lie badly injured. I took the picture of the boy in the van. I originally thought that the boy was, was deceased. Um, because of the, he had a wound to the right side of his head and he wasn't moving. Um, and when I went back out to the van, um, he made like a labored breath movement. And um, that's when I started screaming that the boy's alive, the boy's alive. And uh, I grabbed him, started running him to the Bradley, which is now. At this point, he looks up at me, and I look down at him, um, and I told him, it's going to be okay. I have you. Don't worry. It's going to be okay. Um, and his eyes rolled back into his head, and at that point, I thought that he possibly had just died in my arms. After this day, I couldn't justify what I was doing in Iraq anymore. I became um, very angry with the war the death and destruction of, of innocent people. That's not what I joined the military for. WikiLeaks posts the video on the internet in April 2010. In Baghdad, the victims' families watch as the carnage unfolds. The father who was driving the van died. The two children miraculously survived. We were on our way to school from my uncle's house. Who did you help? The wounded. We were going to take them. But why were you there that day, though? The video will also change Ethan McCord's life. Well, again, good afternoon to you. In America today, we are dealing with some newly released and extraordinarily graphic combat video of brutal... I had just got done dropping my kids off at school back in April 2010. Um, I went home, grabbed a cup of coffee, sat down on the couch, and turned on the news. And uh, there I was running across the screen of my own television, um, carrying a child. Um, I knew immediately what it was, um, and it actually felt like a huge slap in the face. I had spent so much time trying to forget that incident, um, and then here it was being pushed in my face again. These days, Ethan McCord is an anti-war activist. I wasn't, wasn't perceiving that it would affect the soldiers uh, when they saw the ground troops, when they saw themselves uh, in the video. Uh, four have become conscientious objectives, public conscientious objectives uh, of, that, of that unit of, I'm not sure how many, 22 or something. There is an incident that's been widely publicized of collateral murder. I was in that unit. I was the soldier that pulled the children from the van. You know, when I first came back, I, I tried to uh, speak out um, about the war, and, and nobody wanted to listen to me. Um, everybody was like, yeah, yeah, okay. You know, just another crazy veteran wanting to speak. But when the video came out and they realized that I was the soldier on the ground in that video, then everybody wanted to talk to me. One month after the video was posted, the American army arrests a soldier in Baghdad. Not the helicopter pilot who opened fire on the civilians, 
but the man who's suspected of having leaked the video. His name is Bradley Manning. Bradley Manning is a young 22-year-old Army intelligence specialist, only a couple of years in the Army. He felt that there were operations going on. He felt that there had been civilian deaths and other things about war that the American people and that the world should know about. Manning is betrayed to the FBI by former hacker Adrian Lamo. The two young men knew each other. They used to chat on the internet. Unwisely, Manning told him everything. It was forwarded to WikiLeaks, and God knows what happens now. Hopefully, worldwide discussion, debates, and reforms. If not, then we're doomed. After betraying Manning, Lamo attends a hacker's convention in New York. Many of those taking part are angry at the informant. Um, private first class Manning was doing, which is acting one's conscience. In that case, I felt compelled. Compelled, I don't believe, is too strong a word. I can't say whether Bradley Manning is resource or not, or, 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 not, or friends of his, or, mm. or whatever. He is in prison now. His motivations uh, were clearly political. He is facing 52 years uh, presently, and they may increase this 52 years in prison for political acts. And so he is a United. He is, as far as I can see, the most important uh, political prisoner in the United States. He is galvanizing the U.S. anti-war movement. He is becoming a centralizer that pulls everyone together, some central figure others can rally around. Across the United States, there are those calling for the young soldier's release. But their efforts are drowned out by the powerful voices of conservative commentators, some of whom have other suggestions for his future. There are traitors in America. Whoever leaked all those documents to the WikiLeaks website is a traitor and should be executed or put in prison for life. And I think anything less than execution is too kind a penalty. Bradley Manning could face up to 52 years in prison if found guilty of high treason. He's suspected of having leaked far more than the helicopter video. The WikiLeaks website becomes famous, its celebrity bringing with it a large increase in its financing. WikiLeaks is financed by contributions from private people. $200,000 for operational costs. Did you have a salary? <clears throat> no. I have never received a salary. Um, I have invested around 30,000 euros into this project from my savings. All my life savings went into this project. WikiLeaks is now playing with the big boys and leaves its hacker's past behind. It's July 2010, and this is Afghanistan. Whistleblowing website WikiLeaks does it again. Last time it was Iraq, this time it's Afghanistan. Our top story this morning, the White House blasting the release of over 90,000 U.S. military records on the war in Afghanistan. WikiLeaks is no longer a lone messenger reporting such bad news. Now the hackers are working alongside three major media outlets, the New York Times, Der Spiegel, and The Guardian. These are internationally renowned publications. They give added weight to WikiLeaks's documents. So this is The Guardian from this morning, uh, 14 pages uh, about this topic, uh, also concurrently in the Spiegel, 17 pages. At his press conference, Assange makes a promising start in front of the cameras. The real story of this material is that it's war. It's one damn thing after another. So how did WikiLeaks, under threat from the Pentagon, form an alliance with three of the world's most respected newspapers? 
Today, versions vary. One of my colleagues went over and tracked down Julian Assange in Brussels at the time and sat down with him and Assange told him that WikiLeaks was proposing to publish a huge quantity of material about Afghanistan, dump it all at once on the internet in the way that WikiLeaks does. Um, and we, we persuaded him that this wasn't such a good idea and it would be a better idea if he let mainstream organizations uh, like us see the material first and work on it. The WikiLeaks leader sees things somewhat differently. The Guardian likes to take credit for uh, more than it has done. It has done very good work um, in producing those 14 pages. Uh, it was not you know, an innovation by The Guardian for this organization to deal with the mainstream press in any way whatsoever. We've been doing that for years. Okay, uh, because he told us that he had to convince, to, to convince WikiLeaks to, to collaborate with the mainstream yeah, media. Ab absolutely <laughs> false. <laughs> WikiLeaks markets itself, as you, if you like, as a countercultural phenomenon, something that is an alternative to the mainstream press. They used to see themselves as hackers, really, uh, with an ideology that they were going to overthrow capitalism, I think. Now they've started to talk about themselves as being publishers. The two men did, however, quickly agree about the money. Absolutely not. It was all, no money was involved in any way. A headquarters is set up at the Guardian offices in London to sift through and analyze the leaked documents. Journalists from the US and Germany arrive. I was sent over from the New York Times here in Washington in uh, early June to help review what the Guardian had, what, what had come from WikiLeaks. We set up a secret office on the fourth floor of this building that nobody else was allowed in. Uh, and we had this kind of little international bunker, a uh, war room. And essentially what we found were there were some 92,000 documents. Uh, these are incident logs, uh, war reports in Afghanistan and to some parts along the Afghan-Pakistan border. And we did a lot of work on going through these logs, trying to decode them. A lot of them were written in an almost impenetrable military jargon full of abbreviations and acronyms. The journalists from the New York Times uncover secret service reports that focus on Pakistan, a key US ally in the region. There in black and white, the intelligence reports seem to confirm what had previously only been rumored, that Pakistan is, in fact, Washington's worst enemy. The facts are given full coverage in the media. One of the main uh, findings that we came up with these documents was that the Pakistani military and intelligence service, the ISI, very closely supports the, some of the Taliban and other insurgent activities in Afghanistan as a way of keeping the coalition forces off balance there. The content of the dispatches is such the New York Times feels obliged to speak with the most senior administration officials in Washington. We basically went to the White House and said, we have had access to these 92,000 classified documents, military documents from the war in Afghanistan. WikiLeaks intends to put these out publicly. We have had access to them for the last few weeks, and we feel we've done a responsible job at filtering them, and we are not going to publish all these documents. And we asked the White House, do you have any objections? Because you need to raise them now before we publish. And the White House then went back to the Pentagon, to the CIA, and they eventually came back with a few very small changes and requests. The documents obtained by WikiLeaks also include the names of some of the people who collaborate with the U.S. military. In Afghanistan, as in Iraq, the U.S. Army uses local translators and guides. To the insurgents, these people are traitors. To avoid being recognized, their faces are covered during operations alongside the American forces. Naming them is dangerous. For the first time, WikiLeaks comes under attack from some of its biggest supporters, including Reporters Without Borders.
We wrote them an open letter saying we thought it was irresponsible to publish these official documents. It was certainly in the public interest to make these cables known, but they should have first ensured that the names of Afghan civilians were not published or first removed. Reporters Without Borders, however, sees its own letter used in a virulent campaign against WikiLeaks. The globally respected NGO is forced to backpedal. The letter was picked up by a lot of media everywhere, and some media used it to attack WikiLeaks' credibility as an organization as a whole. Now, here's your Pentagon Channel report. Secretary of Defense Robert Gates and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Admiral Mike Mullen are speaking out about the WikiLeaks case. Good afternoon. It's a theme happily taken up by the Pentagon, where WikiLeaks is described as a criminal organization. The battlefield consequences of the release of these documents are potentially severe and dangerous. Mr. Assange can say whatever he likes about the greater good he thinks he and his source are doing. But the truth is, they might already have on their hands the blood of some young soldier or that of an Afghan family. It was, of course, unfortunate that uh, uh, some names were actually published there. But uh, it has been overplayed quite a bit uh, with very dramatic and, and ridiculous words from Pentagon that uh, Wikileaks might have blood on his hand. And that coming from you know, organization <laughs> which have, you know, quite a bit of blood on its hands is uh, almost hypocritical. And as of now, I mean, there have been no reported uh, incidents of, of, of anyone that has been, been hurt by this information. A few weeks later, in October 2010, WikiLeaks invites 300 members of the media to a news conference in a luxurious London hotel. They are set to announce revelations about the war in Iraq. The cream of the media crop is in attendance. Julian Assange had been keeping a low profile for several weeks, but on this morning he faces up to the media attention. He appears to be enjoying the limelight. This is Warlogs.wikileaks.org, it is the interface to explore and analyze uh, these four... Even within uh, Wikileaks, there are those who criticize Julian Assange for hogging all the attention. Julian's approach was to just rush things and to, to, to blast out those big, those few big leaks. And um, concentrate only on those leaks. Yes, uh, because they... They're what gives you most popularity, you know, and that's not the approach. I'm not into being popular. It was the right approach if you want to build a personality, if you want to become, I don't know, Time Magazine Man of the Year or something like this, but it's not the right approach in respect to the ideals of this organization. The Iraqi revelations once again make banner headlines in the media. They include hundreds of thousands of U.S. Army internal memos and mission reports. A huge amount of information that is decoded at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in London. This is a collection of all sort of 390,000 reports uh, pulled into one database. This is six years of the U.S. military in Iraq from their view, so this is what they were saying internally. It's, it's quite a, you know, it's unique. But the evidence that is uncovered differs from the official version of events. I mean, one of the reasons the US say they went to war was to prevent Al-Qaeda um, kind of growing. Al-Qaeda, for about three first three years of the reports, not mentioned at all. The basic story the U.S. government feeds to the public is about ongoing operations against al-Qaeda's foreign recruits. The truth, however, is the majority of the war is really conducted against Iraqi insurgents, often Shiite nationalists armed by Iran, as these Secret Service documents show. Soon, the Shiite militias begin to attack other Iraqis, the Sunnis, 
the civil war spins out of control and becomes ever more deadly. WikiLeaks finds another partner, the newspaper Le Monde. After the US, the UK and Germany, the French press also enters the ring. WikiLeaks's empire is getting bigger. They're not journalists in the classic sense, so they need us. They're intermediaries rather than mediators, but intermediaries who play a crucial role. Our job is to evaluate the information, to analyze and dissect it, to decode and decipher it, and that's what our small team did. The two Iraqi specialists pored over the documents to judge just how far they shed light on recent events. It's simply the story of things that go bad during military occupations, wherever they might be. The weakness of the WikiLeaks documents is that in the majority of the reports, the military changed the facts. That's the real drawback with these leaked documents. They show a daily routine as seen by the military, but it's not always the truth about the war in Iraq. So what's in there needs to be put into perspective. There are a lot of gaps, things missing, unfortunately. We conducted a fascinating reality check testing the legitimacy of the documents obtained by WikiLeaks with an investigation on the ground. It concerns an event that dates to 2006, when a huge number of people were taken hostage in Baghdad. It was a traumatic time for the Iraqis. So how do the military documents WikiLeaks possesses refer to this event? Do you think it's possible to check on, on something that happened in November 2006? They took 150 hostages from the Minister of Higher Education in Baghdad. I was there the day after. Let's have a quick look. Flashback to Baghdad, November 2006. It's the height of the Civil War. Each dawn, dozens of dead bodies are strewn in the streets. Some are bound with brand new handcuffs. On the 14th of November, 150 people, the largest number of hostages ever seized in Iraq, were taken in this building. The Ministry of Higher Education. It's a bold attack taking place in the heavily protected center of the city. So what happened exactly? Men in police uniform entered the ministry and rounded up everyone they found. In the bunker in Baghdad's green zone, the US Army's spokesperson prepares a statement. The official explanation is quite straightforward. The men are terrorists, disguised as police, having bought their uniforms in a local flea market. That's exactly what these uh, extremist elements were, were trying to create. So they'll try, try to get these police uniforms, uh, put them on, and masquerade as police when it's the very thing that's trying to bring back security <coughs> and stability uh, for this country. Um, so that, that's a, a tool that they're using uh, trying to discredit this government. The disguised terrorists account is the same version found in military memos acquired by WikiLeaks. What is strange though is the war's largest kidnapping incident gets so few mentions. So let's see what we get if we just look at kidnapping. So this is Cole detailing a kidnapping. The kidnapped people are from the Ministry of Higher Education and Scientific Research. They were riding in a Kia bus and the kidnappers put them in a different bus with blue blinds. Mm -hmm. the kidnappers had a north on the site. So this is the 9th Iraqi Army okay. that received the information. Okay. And they have no more information than that? No. It's funny because they have less information than what I had of being on the field. It's funny, some small incidents get okay. huge write-ups and some big ones. In fact, the military memos contain much misinformation. In 
Baghdad, the rumor was the kidnappers weren't terrorists disguised as policemen, but real policemen, members of a special unit. The following day, we visit the site of the mass kidnapping. The ministry is deserted, apart from the local police who are guarding the building. As soon as we mention the hostage incident, however, there's a deafening silence. There's a witness over there playing dominoes. He was here that day and saw everything. Did you think they were real policemen or did you have a doubt? Honestly, from what I could see, they were part of the government, and I'm not the only one who said that. Besides, coming here to the center of Baghdad and taking over a street packed with 30 official vehicles, that wasn't terrorists, it was the government. But which government, I couldn't say. We discover the assault on the ministry was the settling of scores between two rival and very legal political parties, both of which were in government. One is Shiite, the other Sunni. The insurgents and terrorists, disguised or not, had in fact nothing to do with the incident, something confirmed by Iraqi intelligence. Everyone knows it was one of the militias that are very active in Baghdad, which was behind the kidnappings. You know which militia did it, but you cannot say it because they have a party in the parliament? Yes, the militias are in fact connected with parties represented in parliament. The hostage incident illustrates just how chaotic Iraq has become and is particularly disturbing. By November 2006, the war had spread to within the government itself. It's all highly embarrassing, yet it fails to make the evening news in the West and is hardly mentioned in the military dispatches in the hands of WikiLeaks. Basically, when you have all those documents, what you are seeing is uh, what the eyes of the US Army see. If the eyes are misled or if they're blind, then the information will be false. That's correct. That's right. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have value. There may be, I mean, there may have been some report that happened, you know, presumably there was some intelligence investigation as to why this happened. Some other detail. That you don't have. That we, we don't have some other long detailed thing produced by the CIA or something. Just like all statements by all people, you have to see what their motivation is uh, in amplifying some things and restricting others. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the base ingredient for any investigation, mm -hmm. but it is the, the start, it is not the conclusion. Effectively, WikiLeaks can only see what the US Army wants to see. And this, maybe, is WikiLeaks's drawback. And now, prepare for the next installment. WikiLeaks about to rock the U.S. government again. A Fox News alert, the United States now scrambling, doing damage control. WikiLeaks exposing yet another explosion. The U.S. government's run of bad luck continues. In November 2010, it's revealed that WikiLeaks handed over hundreds of thousands of diplomatic cables to the same newspapers, as well as the Spanish daily El País. Confidential messages sent to Washington by U.S. embassies around the world. U.S. diplomacy is being stripped bare. All right, here's a question for you. Should the WikiLeaks website be labeled a, quote, terrorist organization? The latest revelations provoke a storm of fury against WikiLeaks and its allies in the United States. This guy is an absolute threat, not just to American security, but to global security. Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. I think Obama should put out a contract and maybe use a drone or something. In Paris, the newspaper Le Monde has the 250,000 diplomatic documents. They're published just a very few at a time. After the Iraq files were published, Julian Assange got back in touch and offered us these documents. 
But where are the 250,000 documents? Can we see them? No, because of security we can't show them. It's just a team working in a room. Have the documents been digitalized? Yes, they are in a computer, of course, but the computers aren't connected. The computers are not on the Internet, to avoid being hacked by the secret services. Wikileaks, Wikileaks against its basic instincts, allowed us to lead on this because Assange knew all too well the documents were far too sensitive. Effectively, and the Americans are right, they would endanger too many people. So our best experts are deciding which names should not be revealed. It's all very humiliating for the USA. Their plans to spy in intimate detail on United Nations bureaucrats have been revealed. The directive from Hillary Clinton merely revives a previous order from 2004. And it's certainly one of the disclosures that most annoyed the Americans, because they are directly implicated. It was a command that clearly made the diplomats into spies, with specific instructions to get information such as credit card numbers, even DNA samples. Now, whether they stole snippets of hair, took champagne glasses where there were still traces of saliva, we can't say. But what we can say is that the directive was sent to every embassy. At the UN, strict orders were issued forbidding comment on the revelations. Globally, however, almost every government complained about WikiLeaks, including France. Stealing information such as this, publishing it and taking it out of context, well, I think it's an insult to our country. It's unacceptable. Renaud Musilier, who is close to French government circles, is extremely bitter against what he says is the excessive transparency advocated by WikiLeaks. Yet, this former French Secretary of State witnessed government lies and their bloody consequences. My colleagues, Every statement I make today is backed up by sources, solid sources. These In 2003, Renaud Musilier was the second most senior French diplomat. At the United Nations, he listened as the Americans tried to convince the rest of the world to join in the war against Iraq. France was against the war and opposed the Americans. I believe this conclusion is irrefutable and undeniable. That was probably the biggest lie of all. It was incredible as they showed us the sites, explaining the warehouses were full of what they claimed were weapons of mass destruction. It was all a smokescreen. Would it have been right to expose this deliberately false statement, as WikiLeaks believes? The former minister seems to find that question hard to answer. When Colin Powell conducted his little slideshow, did you know he was lying? We knew he was lying about nuclear weapons of mass destruction. How did you know that? Because of the intelligence that was available, or had been exchanged, the cross-checks that different countries undertake. So we were quite convinced there were no nuclear weapons of mass destruction. From a moral viewpoint, do you agree it would have been right to give the public access to secret documents that in fact prove the danger posed by Iraq had been exaggerated? I myself am not convinced that all this information should have been made available. I believe a powerful nation needs to have various sources of information to be able to make the right decision. But should it be allowed to lie to the public? Well, in that particular instance, they deliberately lied. Is it acceptable, though, knowing that 5,000 young Americans have been killed and tens of thousands of others injured? That's another issue. But beyond the human drama for the Americans, there's the human drama for the Iraqis and a real drama when it comes to the impact on world stability. All because of this quote-unquote lie. What do you expect at the end of the day with all this material? Well, I, I hope it creates 
disincentives for engaging in immoral conduct in war. So disincentives for engaging in war, in war crimes uh, in Iraq, in other places. It gives the victims of war in Iraq a sense of justice, a better understanding of how war goes and how war goes wrong. Possibly the most valuable thing to come out of it. After the publication of the cables, the pressure on Assange increases considerably. There's 120 people, according to media reports, were headed up by a general um, just outside of the Pentagon who do nothing else but um, target us. Defence Intelligence Agency and FBI uh, internally called the WikiLeaks War Room. In the United States at the moment, there is an attempt to get up an espionage prosecution uh, against me and other people. How do you sleep with that at night? Oh, you know, we, we publish a lot of information. We have a big impact on the world. So the United States um, intelligence community plus military is uh, what, may, maybe 1.5 million uh, people. So 120 is actually not so big. All the media coverage has made Julian Assange the darling of academic circles. He crisscrosses the planet giving speeches before a legion of fans. Um, for the, the first time in the history of the world, there is, for this type of serious material, a real free press. Assange becomes the face of WikiLeaks. The world's media is in a feeding frenzy. For Daniel Domscheit-Berg, the German, it's a betrayal of everything WikiLeaks stands for. The two men confront each other, apparently in an internet chat room. You behave like some kind of emperor or slave traitor. You are suspended for one month, effective immediately. Daniel is suspended. He suspended me for being disloyal and insubordinate and stuff like this, so this is some kind of weird military terminology that he uses himself to deal with uh, people he is working with. Um, you felt betrayed? Yes. Because I did not betray him and I did never ever betray WikiLeaks. In August 2010, Assange's celebrity backfires. Two young women in Sweden claim he refused to wear a condom before having sex with them. Swedish justice charges Assange with rape. The charges are first thrown out by one judge, but then reinstated by another a few weeks later. The entire planet seems to know of Assange's problems. It, it appears to be highly irregular uh, and some kind of legal circus. It was clearly a smear campaign and that who is behind this, we do not know. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange has been arrested in London as part of a Swedish sex crimes investigation. Sweden in December 2010, Assange is arrested in the UK and held behind bars for several days. Under pressure from the American government, the WikiLeaks site is blocked. With fewer means of raising money and no web host, WikiLeaks has been handicapped. Is this the end? Probably not, as other sites prepare to spring up across the internet. Daniel Domscheit-Berg quit WikiLeaks and is setting up the next generation of online whistleblower sites. WikiLeaks has, I think, triggered an enormously important movement in society. It's a cultural change that we see happening today. And this cultural change is more important than any single publication that has been made. There will be hundreds of websites that can accept documents and that just use the technology for accepting these submissions. The powers that be are probably not going to be able to relax anytime soon.
Join us next week as six young consumers learn firsthand the hardships of working in Africa and Asia in blood, sweat and luxuries next Wednesday night on ABC2. But coming up next, Britain's missing top model continues. So much time, why it's taking so long for him to do whatever he's doing. The young soldier is crazy about IT. In the world of the internet, WikiLeaks is already famous. It's a site that dares publish what the mainstream media might censor. The word wiki means accessible to all and in all safety. We have an anonymous uh, safe harbor, so we accept these documents anonymously. Um, we have very strong mechanisms to protect the sources that we have. And Danielle Domscheit-Berg was one of those who helped build the unique WikiLeaks website. It was built in a way that whistleblowers remain anonymous to the project itself. So whenever something was received, it was not clear uh, where it came from. So the whistleblower should feel secure in a way that if he feels something should be out in the public, um, there is not an instance that is then judging about his feelings. It's difficult to tell what is actually happening in the video sent by the soldier. It needs deciphering. When I first saw it, actually it didn't have that much impact on me. Because I didn't know where it was, when it was, what was the circumstances, who were these people, etc. It was only by following the path through the thing and seeing how relaxed and sort of innocent most of the people were in the video that the carnage then became uh, so outrageous. To make sense of the video, the WikiLeaks people took it to Iceland, a remote island in Europe's North Atlantic. The island state was brought to the brink of bank with just a few computers. A small group of young journalists and programmers has become a real nightmare for the world's only superpower. The WikiLeaks legend really begins during the Iraq War. In an army base 65 kilometers from Baghdad, a young American GI is classifying military intelligence in a computer. Incident reports and video filmed by the combat troop. He's regularly in direct contact with evidence of war's daily brutality. Innocent civilians indiscriminately killed. The thousands of victims no one seems to care about. And hardly any of this ever makes the evening news. Until one day this anonymous GI sees a video filmed from an Apache helicopter showing a military engagement unfold in the streets of Baghdad. The evidence before his eyes seems to indicate proof of a war crime. The soldier risks disobeying orders and makes a CD-ROM of the video. If he's caught, he knows he'll be court-martialed. So he comes up with an unusual alibi. The question is, how was he able to download all this information without drawing suspicion to himself? So, in fact, he told people, apparently, that when he was actually downloading some of this sensitive information onto a CD, he was actually listening to Lady Gaga. I mean, it wasn't true at all, but that's what he told people. And they said, oh, okay, that's fine. That, now we understand what he's, why he's spending so... T the following program is rated M for a mature audience. It contains coarse language and violence. This is BBC News, the headlines at midnight. Up to 400,000 secret American military files about the Iraq war are published. From CBS News World Headquarters. It is a leak that is more like a flood. Hundreds of thousands of secret U.S. military documents from the Iraq war released today by the website WikiLeaks. The 
first casualty of war is the truth. But the attack on the truth by war begins long before war starts and continues long after a war ends. Are they modern day heroes? Today's Robin Hood's helping their fellow man. Or are they irresponsible hackers out for fame and glory? We should condemn in the most uh, clear terms that a WikiLeaks has provided the public with thousands of state secrets. Is Julian Assange a criminal? Well, I think Assange should be assassinated, actually. <laughs> this is me here grabbing the boy and running with the boy. When the video came out and they realized that I was the soldier on the ground in that video, then everybody wanted to talk to me. Will the disclosures change the world? How far can one trust what's in the documents? It's funny, some club in Berlin, to name but one. In some way, I, I assume I can be called a hacker. A hacker is anyone who is interested in um, bringing change to a system, and that's certainly part of what I'm doing. Hi guys, good afternoon. WikiLeaks also has its share of enemies. The biggest threat comes from the US Army, from whom they WikiLeaks spirited away hundreds of thousands us. of documents. We want whatever they have returned to us, and we want whatever copies they have expunged, erased, gone. The very first warnings by the Pentagon were somewhat vague. We are asking them to do the right thing. We are asking them to return stolen property. If doing the right thing is not good enough for them, uh, then we will figure out what other alternatives we have to compel them to do the right thing. Um, let me leave it at that. Daphne. Do you own a mobile phone? Do I? I have many mobile phones, but when you're involved in this sort of business, um, there's security procedures you have to go through to prevent mobile phones being used to tracking you. And th those procedures are known to intelligence agencies, uh, or drug dealers, and so on. Uh, investigative journalists should look more about uh, what drug dealers and intelligence agencies do to protect themselves. Their story is a modern myth, armed with small incidents, okay. huge write-ups and some big ones, not at all. It's the base ingredient for any investigation, mm -hmm. but it is the, the start, it is not the conclusion. The White House blasting the release of over 90,000 U.S. military records on the war in So what is behind WikiLeaks? We've examined their strengths and weaknesses, the myth and the mystery. <laughs> Getting inside WikiLeaks isn't easy. Each of their workplaces is carefully hidden from prying eyes, temporary operating centers. In London, WikiLeaks has based itself inside the offices of a non-profit organization, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. Julian Assange is known to occasionally spend time here. He seems to encourage the Matrix-like secrecy. WikiLeaks exists in a virtual space and obviously also in real spaces. We're a multinational organization, so we have technical infrastructure, financial infrastructure, and people um, all over the world. But we don't have you know, our locations listed publicly. And there's very good reasons for that. WikiLeaks has been around since 2006, and Julian Assange is not the website's only boss. Hackers appear to be the driving force. Daniel Domscheit-Berg of the Chaos Computer